a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today is the 25th of December 2017 and I've come to the table to read to you the 17th part of the book from Martin Luther that he published in 1545 against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil. And uh, last time we finished, finally, <laughs> after uh, 10 readings or something, or 11 readings, with point 1, or part 1 of the book. Because, as you remember, Martin Luther wanted to address three different points um, when writing this book. Yeah? Um, as he said here, I wanted to cover three things, three different points, three different subjects, to prove to us, in his own words, and based on the Bible, that the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church is the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. I know that there are scoffers out there who always comment on these kind of videos or other videos that I make where I mention that the papacy is the Antichrist who says no it is not. And people like today um, I uh, published the 13th part of the reading from me and Tom Fress uh, where, we were spoken, where we were speaking about this booklet uh, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism and I published today the 13th video that is called The 70 Weeks of Daniel and the very first comment um, that I could read thereon of course is um, uh, another person who says you are missing many more scriptures which explains further truth. No, I'm not missing anything, but you are all misled if you don't believe that Daniel 70, 70 years week is completely and utterly fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ 2000 years ago. When you don't believe that the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is the proof of the 70th week fulfilled by Jesus Christ when you don't believe that the papacy is the antichrist you are taken by your nose like a cow with ha that has a ring through its nose you are taken the same way and you are then led on the broad road that leads to perdition instead of the small path that leads to salvation and to the true shepherd shepherd that is jesus christ i don't care for these comments anymore because people can have their opinion as much as they want. But I know that the Bible does never ever speak against itself but it always confirms itself. And when you read the Bible with the right understanding there is no other way but to understand that the 70th week of Daniel has been completely fulfilled. Nowhere in the Bible will you find any sentence that says that the 70th week is cut off from the 69th week. And surely not for 2000 or more years. There is not one sentence in the Bible that says that. There is not one sentence in the Bible that says that the Jews are getting another salvation than the Gentiles when after Jesus Christ has come. There was made a new covenant and I'm not really I'm really not going into this but I just want to say uh, how about you watch that video, The 70 Weeks of Daniel, uh, just 70 Weeks of Daniel, I call it. It's published the 25th of December 2017. So that's <coughs> probably a few weeks uh, after I will publish this one, because there are so many other things and videos that I have to publish in the meantime. Watch that and watch The Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden that I recorded with Tom Fress in the beginning of uh, 2015 already. 
and uh, the consequences of not understanding the 70th week of the, of the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, um, which was another part that we also did in 2015. There is no other way but to understand the Bible the way the Bible explains itself. Every time when you listen to a man explaining to you the Bible in a different way than the Bible explains itself, then you have to ask yourself, who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe the Word of God or am I going to believe that man? And since, and, and don't start even with the Roman Catholic Church, because the Roman Catholic Church does not accept the Bible as um, the main authority, because she says that tradition is above the scripture. And the Pope has the power to change the word. So, the Pope has power to change the word, that means the Pope has the power also to explain to you the word in the way that he wants to be explained. And how does the Pope want to explain the Bible? Well, not in a biblical way, because the Pope is not the... Uh, the representative of Jesus Christ here on earth, he is the representative of the devil on earth. He is the devil hid under the mask of humanity. Huh? And that is what Martin Luther proves in this book, that last work that he wrote before he died. And we're going into that later. So Martin Luther wanted to cover three things. First, and we have dealt with that the last, I think, 12 parts of this reading, whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom. Is it true that the Pope is above councils, emperors, angels, as he boasts? No. And we have proven that extensively through the last readings, that the Pope is not above emperors, councils, angels, and that he is not the head of Christendom, even that Roman Catholicism is not Christendom itself anyway, is something we understood. Now, second, Martin Luther wants to prove whether it is true that no one may sentence, judge or depose of the Pope, as he bellows. And this second point is what we are going to start today with on the page 359 in this book, and I'm going to start reading right now. This time, Martin Luther says, I cannot deal at length with whether it is true that the papal ass can neither be sentenced or judged by anyone, as he raves in his decretals. But I intend to do it later, <coughs> if I live, and God wills. But we all understand, of course, that Martin Luther died before he could take on that chore, or that next book, where he goes into a deeper explanation of this point two that he wants to make, and point three that comes afterwards. He dealt extensively with point one and I think that he could of course even have longer dealt with point one but he wanted to deal with three points and Martin Luther felt the life getting out of him. And the Lord took him in the beginning of 1546, less than a year after the publishing of this book. So he says, but I intend to do it later, means to write another book if I live, and God wills, no, he lived not, and God did not want it. God said, enough. You have done what I called you for. And now it is done. And there are other people who, of course, will continue your work. And there were a lot of Protestant writers, and two that come right into my head are James Aitken Wiley, for example, and Henry Gretton Guinness, who continued his work in a lot of sense. And also, for a great part, Charles Henry Spurgeon. So there we have three other Protestant writers who continued what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther writes a book against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil, and James Edgar Wiley has written The Pope is the Antichrist, a demonstration. Same subject. Same culprit. The Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Martin Luther continues to put it briefly. You have heard above, in part one, what a devil spirit, what a blasphemer, what an instigator of all kinds of idolatry, man of sin and child of petition, according to the Bible, the Pope is. 
That is why he answers here to this point. Uh, to this point is, sorry. That that is why the answer here to this point is briefly. Of course, no one on earth has the right to judge or condemn the Pope, except only everyone who is baptized or still in possession of human reason and all God's creatures. Yes, when you say we are not to judge, then you should read the Bible again. We are also even to judge the angels, and therefore we are not to judge the Antichrist for what he is, for what spirit possesses him, for what works he is doing? Sure we are. That's why Martin Luther says, Of course no one on earth has the right to judge or condemn the Pope, except everyone who is baptized, and we are speaking about the true baptism in the Spirit, in the Spirit of God the Father and Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit. We are speaking of born-again Christians in the biblical sense and the baptizing of that, the full emerging under water and not the sprinkling of drops of water on your head, which is Babylonian tradition. And also Martin Luther says, or still in possession of human reason, because this is what the Jesuits tried to take away with their kind of education. They <laughs> they put on all of us yeah? that we cannot even reason by ourselves anymore and all God's creatures so wh who is all God's creatures? all the people that God has chosen his people salvation is by God um, we have to go there to the book of Ephesians let me just uh, check that for a second. Oh, that's the wrong picture that I have open here. Um, we have to go to uh, Philippians. That's it. Yeah, not Ephesians. We have to go to Philippians chapter 3 and there verse 9 and it says that I am um, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Yeah? That's the very interesting point. God's creatures, every human being, if you want to put it in Antichrist terms, human being, that has been chosen by Christ, by the Father, the righteousness is imputed to him of God by faith. All these people are absolutely allowed to judge the Pope, the Antichrist, for his doings and undoings, for his crimes and everything else that he sets on. Because all the crimes that are alleged for the Roman Catholic Church eventually leave to the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, and that is Satan. That is the Pope who is a mask of Satan on this earth. Martin Luther says, For when a person is baptized, he, or his godparents in his stead, must first swear that he renounces the devil and all his works and all his nature. Now, of course, here is something that I do not agree with Martin Luther, and that is something that you should know. Martin Luther was not perfect. When Martin Luther says, when a person is baptized, he or his godparents in his stead must first swear that he renounces the devil and all his works and all his nature. Another person can not swear for me that I do renounce the works of the devil and all his nature. Second of all, we are not allowed to swear, as the Bible says in another point. Yeah, in another part of the Bible, it says, "Let your yea be a nay, and your uh, your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, and everything else is of the devil." Don't swear. Yeah? I think that is in Matthew chapter seven, if I'm not mistaken. And um, here, 
Martin Luther actually makes a reference to child baptism for the godparents in his stead. Well, there are no godparents in biblical uh, baptism. When Jesus Christ was baptized in the river Jordan by John the uh, Baptist, do you know of anything written in the Bible where stood that there were godparents that uh, Jesus had? Or that anybody had who John the Baptist baptized in the river Jordan or wherever when he did his ministry and fulfilled the baptism to clear the way of God? Godparents and child baptism is Babylonian. And Martin Luther did not completely understand this all through his life. He still had Roman Catholic leaven in his body. And that is understandable. There are many people who have this and many people who will never get that up. And I understand that. Therefore I don't judge them, but I point that out. And I point that out with Martin Luther here too. When Martin Luther says, for when a person is baptized, he or his godparents in his stead must first swear that he renounces the devil and all his works and all his nature, I agree when you scrap or his godparents in his stead. No, when a person is baptized, he must swear, <laughs> not swear, but I'd like to say promise, that he renounces the devil and all his works and all his nature that he declares before he is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ I renounce the devil for and all his works and his nature for what they are. I renounce them and I will have nothing to do with them. And now I am going to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now the nature and works of the Pope are nothing but the devil's work and nature, Martin Luther continues, as has been amply proved all through reading this book so far. That is why every baptized child is not only a judge over the Pope, but also over his God, the devil. And again, I do not agree with Martin Luther about the baptized child. Baptism is a sign that you have been saved and you can only be saved when you understand scripture and a child cannot understand scripture that is why Jesus Christ did not start his ministry when he was a child he started his ministry when he was 30 years old that was when he was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist when he was 30 years of age that was the time to become a minister according to the Levitical law yeah? and not a child. So that is why every baptized man is not only a judge over the Pope but also over his God the devil. I have to alter the way that Martin Luther wrote the sentence in the way that I just read to you. Moreover he is commanded to avoid, flee, and trample the Pope, the devil, and all his creatures. As Psalms 91 verse 13 says, quote, You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Unquote. And in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 2 through 3, uh, quote, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? Etc. That's the point that I made already a little bit earlier. And I'm going to open my uh, King James Bible in, these, in the online version here uh, at this place to read it again in the complete con uh, King James Version. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 2 to 3 do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life 
We are not to judge. We are. But there's a difference if we are judging people who are part of the body of Christ or if we are judging people who are not part of the body of Christ. There's a big difference. Anyway, also in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 it says, quote, God has raised up uh, God has raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Unquote. I hope that in the heavenly life one can judge devil, pope, world, sin, death and hell. Second, all human reason says that he who neither understands something nor is able to cannot judge it or decide, praise, scold, condemn or evaluate it. Whatever one is to judge must be recognized and understood. Now it was proved above, and it is the plain truth that the Pope, the Cardinals and the whole Curia and gang are nothing but a stable full of crass, crude, clumsy, blaspheming asses, who have no knowledge of Scripture, do not know what God, what Christ, what Church, what Bishop, what God's Word, what Spirit, what Baptism, what Sacrament, what Keys what good works are. These are enough strong witnesses on this, uh, of this available. Their books, decrees, decretals, sextai, clement, uh, clementinae, extravagantes, bulls and countless books. So I live, Dr. Martin Luther, besides many others, I, who was raised in the Pope's school and donkey stable and became doctor of theology, indeed was praised as a learned good doctor and was one too so that i trust i know very well and can truly prove very well how deep high broad and long their knowledge of holy scripture is namely that they are inimical asses they are inimical asses they know nothing of scripture it was proved i'm gonna read this again it was proved above and it is in the plain truth that the pope the cardinals the whole curia and gang are nothing but a stable full of crass crude clumsy blaspheming asses who have no knowledge of scripture who have no knowledge of scripture they do not know what god what Christ, what Church, what Bishop, what God's Word, what Spirit, what Baptism, what Sacrament, what Keys, what good works are. They do not know what good works are. They are em inimical asses. Their lawyers themselves testify in public that canon law stinks of sheer greed, ambition and power, and that a canonist is an ass. And both are true. Now tell me, where do they get such a judgment, if not from human natural reason, whereby they judge the Pope to be an ambitious, proud, insatiable miser, a paunch knave and servant of mammon, which St. Paul calls service to idols and idolatry in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. If the lawyers judge, praise and command the Pope in this way, where shall we theologians find the words to condemn and rebuke him? Isn't this called a true likeness of the Pope? Isn't he in works and teaching possessed and driven by the devil? And it turns out that he is, quote, master of faith, lord of the churches, unquote, as we can read in Magister Fidei, Regula Ecclesiarum. That is, a teacher of mammon, of greed and sheer idolatry, a doctor in the school of scoundrels. So, dear lawyers, 
go ahead and praise the Pope well in comfort and do it so spitefully that we theologians won't have room to judge him worse. Well, that is what reason does when it judges like this. Third, a natural donkey which carries sex to the mill and eats thithels can also judge the holy Roman Curia. Indeed, all creatures can, for a donkey knows it is a donkey and not a cow. Again, it knows it is a male, not a female. A stone knows it is a stone, water is water, and so on through all the creatures. But the mad papal asses in Rome do not know that they are asses. They do not even know whether they are women or men. In summary, they can do nothing but devour endowments, convents and the world's goods, rob and steal the crowns of kings and lead vain, unnatural, perverted, devilish lives, over which all creation is frightened, trembles, shakes and cries out about the donkey stable to him who made them subject to such corruption. Romans chapter 8 verse 21 stands therefore that he should deliver them, which he will soon do. The point Martin Luther makes here of Romans chapter 8 verse 21 reads, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Yes, what does the Pope care about such a verdict, since no one dares to punish or depose him? <laughs> well then, I don't want him to care. He is not worthy of caring about it. Balaam did not care that he was punished by his donkey, and afterward by the angel, as we can read in Numbers 22, verses 21 through 35. The Sodomites did not care either that they were punished by Lot. How, they said, are you to be judged over us? as we can read in Genesis chapter 19, verse 9. It is enough for us that we know the Pope is damned by God himself, by all angels, by all Christians, by all of human reason, by all creatures, by their own conscience, even by all devils. So, free of him, his idolatry and his blasphemy, we, with a good conscience, teach and pray against him, dare to spit at him, avoid him and flee from him as from the devil himself, remove him from our hearts and sink him into the depths of hell, and we can turn his accursed teaching around where he screams, whoever is not obedient to the sea of Rome cannot be saved and claim just the opposite, saying, whoever is obedient to the Pope cannot be saved. But whoever would be saved must avoid, flee and damn the Pope, his works and nature, like the devil himself, as our holy baptism teaches and exhorts us. Let this verdict go forth. The judge that follows will not hesitate with his verdict, as St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, quote, The Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by, the, by his appearing and his coming. Yes, but you and your followers are damned heretics. Your judgment is nothing against the Roman sea's judgment, as St. Paul III wrote Emperor Charles that you would not be admitted to the council. First, I shall answer in Latin. And um, I guess we are going to read something in Latin here. Yeah, but I'm not going to read that. This is on the next page. So, first I shall answer in Latin. Quote, and he says this in English now, I ask and demand in the name of all of us from the Roman See, namely from the one which decides whether the popes are men or women, if they are men, they should produce witnesses against us heretics. If they are women, I will quote the saying of Paul, quote, 
the woman should keep silent in the churches, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. It is necessary to demand this in view of the old rumor known throughout Europe that morality is in decay. It is said that kings and queens in the Roman Curia are nothing but hermaphrodites, androgenites, synoidans and pedicons and similar monsters in nature. These are all incompetent to judge heretics. Unquote. Now, what I just read to you was, of course, in English, was not in Latin, but when you go to the footnote on page 362, you will see that everything I read to you here in English is written there in Latin. And the problem was when I was reading the German version of this book, there it was only in Latin and there was no German translation. So I turned to this English book and read the English translation and translated that into German for my German brethren to understand this. And uh, the points that I made in the end when he says it is said that kings and queens in the Roman Curia are nothing but hermaphrodites, androgenites, synoidines and pedicons. Those words are different words for sodomites. They all actually mean the same. Yeah? Luther uses Latin in this part of the book to, in, uh, to imitate the language of the lawyers at that time. Yeah? Because Latin was the, was the tongue of the educated people. And to imitate the language of the lawyers, that is why Martin Luther wrote this in this book original in Latin. And I have just translated that to you. Uh, I have not translated it. I have read to you the translated English version of this. And I'm going to read it once again. I ask and demand in the name of all of us from the Roman See, namely from the one which decides whether the popes are men or women, if they are men, they should produce witnesses against us heretics. And you know, produce witnesses against heretics of the Roman Catholic Church is very difficult because a heretic in the Bible is defined as someone who denies the word of God. Since the Roman Catholic Church is not built on the Word of God, does not teach the Word of God, they really do not have any point of heretics. Yeah? They should produce witnesses against us heretics, and they can't do that. If they are women, I will quote the saying of Paul, women should keep silent in the churches. So we are not to be judged by women. If anything, we are, judged, uh, we are to be judged by men but by men who can produce witnesses against us heretics, and they can produce these witnesses. It is necessary to demand this in the view of the old rumor known throughout Europe that morality is in decay. It is said that kings and queens in the Roman Curia are nothing but hermaphrodites, androgenites, synoidians, pedicons, and similar monsters in nature all kinds of sodomites. These are all incompetent to judge heretics, because to judge you have to be, as Martin Luther said before, a child of God. You have to be chosen and predestined by the Father, and then you can judge. Otherwise you can't. Second, Martin Luther continues, I have proven above that the papal asses of the Roman See are crass, crude asses, ignorant beyond measure of holy scripture, and, as their books testify, they also do not understand the Lord's Prayer. They do not understand the Ten Commandments or the Children's Creed. Yeah? And... Um, this goes into the Augsburg Confession and the Book of Concord. And, um, well, the problem there is that you have wrong Ten Commandments even in that uh, children's creed here. But they do not understand the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. That is why they have no right to judge what is heretical for Christ or, or Christian.
To make such a judgment requires an understanding of the scriptures because heresy, according to the testimony of all ancient and modern teachers, is nothing but an obstinate error against holy scripture. The point that I made a few minutes ago when I told you that we can only be judged by children of God. We can only be judged by people who are not heretics. And heretics are described in the Bible, as Martin Luther says here again, to make such a judgment requires an understanding of the scriptures, because heresy, according to the testimony of all ancient and modern teachers, is nothing but an obstinate error against holy scripture. Heresy is going against the word of God. Heresy is going against the Bible, the written, unerrant word of God. Then you are a heretic, and not the Roman Catholic understanding that when you are not with the Pope, you are a heretic. When you don't submit yourself to the power of the Pope, you are a heretic. When you do not submit yourself to the Roman Catholic canon law, you are a heretic. Those definitions are all wrong. A heretic is someone who commits obstinate error against Holy Scripture and nothing else. The definition of a Roman Catholic, what is a heretic, is a devilish, is a satanic understanding, not the biblical and godly understanding of a heretic. He continues, third, when our confession was examined before the emperor and the whole empire at Augsburg in 1530, so he is speaking about the Augsburg confession, some princes of the other side asked their theologians if one could disprove this with scripture. Interesting, huh? Read it again. When our Augsburg confession was examined before the emperor and the whole empire at Augsburg in 1530, you know where Melanchthon went, because Martin Luther couldn't go there, because he was under the church ban, he was excommunicated, he had to hide, but Melanchthon was there and defended the case of the Protestants, and by the way, when Melanchthon came back, Martin Luther was furious because Melanchthon did not make all the Antichrist points that Martin Luther made. Anyway, it says... When our Augsburg Confession was examined before the Emperor and the whole Empire in Augsburg in 1530, some princes of the other side asked their theologians if one could disprove this with Scripture. You remember when Martin Luther was in Worms in 1521? And he said, unless I am proven by Scripture or by plain reason, to be wrong, I can and will not recant? Could he be proven wrong in his writings on the German nobility of the Babylonian captivity and of his 95 Theses? Could he be proven wrong by scripture at that time? No. And when the Augsburg Confession was made in 1530, you have to understand that is a very, very important point in history. Because that is the first time the term Protestant was formed. When the confession was made by the princes that adhered to the Bible and the Bible alone, when they went to Augsburg and Melanchthon was giving the Augsburg confession to the emperor, that was the protest that started. The protest of Rome. There the word Protestantism derives from. Now some princes of the other side, because you had princes on the side of the Roman Catholic Church, together on the side with the emperor, who was a uh, an advocate, of course, of the Roman Catholic Church. And then you had all the quote-unquote uh, 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 apostate Protestant, as we now call them, of course, princes who came there. And some princes of the other side asked their theologians if one could disprove this with Scripture. Now, what did these theologians answer? No, one could not disprove it with Scripture, 
but with the fathers and councils, unquote. Now, isn't this a very important Roman Catholic sentence we read here once again? No, one could not disprove it with scripture. So, everything that the quote-unquote heretics say, everything what the Protestant princes said, what they brought forth at, at the Augsburg Confession, could not be proven wrong adhering to Scripture, the unfallible Word of God. But, it says, it could be proven wrong with the fathers and councils. Now again, when we take the Bible as our rock of authority, we call no one father but he who is in heaven. Therefore there are no quote-unquote church fathers. And second of all, the councils that have been done by the Roman Catholic Church are the councils that have been done of the synagogue of Satan. And of course these councils speak against the Bible because they don't even know the Bible. They do everything to turn the Bible teaching 180 degrees around like they have done in all through history. The Roman Catholic Church hates the Bible. That's why it hid the Bible for centuries. That's why when you were caught on the streets having a Bible and especially a Bible even in your own language, you were burnt along with it. The Roman Catholic Church does not advocate studying or reading or believing which is even worse, in the Bible. And everything that was said in the Augsburg Confession by the Protestant princes and the theologians that came there, like Melanchthon and others who supported him, everything they said could not be disproved with Scripture, but it could only be disproved with the quote-unquote fathers and the quote-unquote councils of the corrupt church. Because the quote-unquote fathers and the quote-unquote councils are not biblical. With the Bible, with the word of God, nothing could be disproved of what the Protestant princes and theologians that came to the Augsburg Confession in 1530 could be disapproved of. Nothing. Thereupon, some of the noblemen smilingly said, quote, Our theologians defend us excellently. They say the other side has scripture as their favor, but we do not have scripture in our favor. <laughs> yeah. And therefore, I can retreat here to the footnote that says, go to page 190, note number 12. And I will see if I can fastly get there. Open page 190, note number 12, where it says, In 1530, the statement attributed to Duke William of Bavaria is contained in George Spalatin's Something Historical, oder etliche Historica. And uh, you can read that book for yourself if you want to, when you open that work, uh, the, what I just read to you, what did I just read to you? Our theologians defend us excellently. They say the other side has scripture in their favor, but we do not have scripture in our favor. And this is a statement attributed to Duke William of Bavaria. And remind you that Bavaria is the most Roman Catholic state in Germany at that time and still until today. Yeah? It's Roman Catholic to the core. That statement is attributed to Duke William of Bavaria and is contained in George Spalatin's Something Historical. So, Martin Luther uh, even uh, quotes here, or, or cites here, or here in this book is cited another quote, but that of Martin Luther. This book is very well documented. And this is one of the proofs of it. Our theologians, one of the noblemen smilingly said, defend us excellently. They say the other side has scripture in their favor, but we do not have scripture in our favor. 
Out of such admission and testimony of our opponents, we gather that we cannot be heretics because we have, we believe, and we confess Scripture. If those who believe and confess Holy Scripture should be heretics and not Christians, who are those who would be Christians? Think about it. Think about what Martin Luther says here. Out of such admission and testimony of our opponents we gather that we cannot be heretics because we have, we believe and we confess the Holy Scripture. If those who believe and confess Holy Scripture should be heretics as the Roman Catholic Church determines and not Christians in the biblical sense in the book of Acts, who are those who would be called Christian? Is it those who read Markov or Dietrich of Bern or Eulenspiegel? Those are characters of medieval German sagas. Markov appears as the opponent of King Solomon in the 12th century poem. Dietrich of Bern is a pseudonym for the Ostrogothic king Theodoric the Great, who lived in 526 AD in the Nibelungenlied, and Till Eulenspiegel is the adventurous fool in a low German satirical work of 1500. Luther mentions these characters elsewhere also, but the point is that he says, if not we who have believe and confess the scripture are Christians in the biblical sense, who are then the Christians? Those who read Markov, Dietrich, Berner, Eulenspiegel? In other words, those who read Belletristic? Those who read novels? And Shakespeare, I would even add. Shakespeare didn't live at Luther's time, but you know what I mean. Probably you can say who read Omer or whatever Roman or Greek writer you had, the Odyssey, uh, the Odyssey or things like that, when you read stuff like that, are you then called a Christian? Are you called a Christian or understood to be a Christian when you have, believe and confess the scripture? Or are you called a Christian when you have, believe and read books like Markov wrote, Dietrich of Bern wrote or Eulenspiegel wrote? And Eulenspiegel I know quite well. I have been in Mölln when I was in school visiting the city where he came from that is in Schleswig-Holstein in the north of Germany. I was there and he was a what we call in German a Narr, a, uh, a person who drove jokes with other people, you know. Uh, today you would probably say a comedian or whatever. And um, this is a legitimate question of Martin Luther here. Huh? Again, if those who believe and confess Holy Scripture should be heretics and not Christians, who are those who would be Christian? Is it those who read Markov, Dietrich of Bern or Eulenspiegel? Or is it those who read the Pope's filth and stench, which is the same thing, and even worse? Very well then, we are not heretics. Our opponents themselves testify to this. And so they have not dared to call us heretics thenceforth. <laughs> no, but they started doing that in the Council of Trent that started on the same day that Martin Luther published this wonderful book. Instead, some have called us schismatics, some the disturbers, some the innovators. Until now, they call us the protesting estates. They have to avoid the word heretic because they know perfectly well it would be an obvious lie and calumny which they could not prove with a single letter and which would arouse opposition. So, 48 minutes in the reading today and we come to the point on page 363 which I found in a video some time ago and that quote that I found there made me interest in uh, made me have interest in this book in the first place, 
and then uh, by the grace of God, Brother Brett Norman purchased this book and sent that over from the United States of America to me in the English version that I'm reading to you right now. And this is in the very next paragraph that I'm reading here. So I will read this now without any comment and maybe go into comments a little bit later. But this coming paragraph that I read to you now is the one that when I read an excerpt of that in one of the videos on YouTube I watched, that made me interest in having this book and the moment that I had this book in my hand I wanted to read this to my brethren in English on YouTube as I do right now. Then I also purchased this in German and I did the complete German reading during the months of October 2017 and uh, I published the last reading of that very fittingly on the 31st of October 2017 for the 500th anniversary of Reformation Day. And now we are coming on page 363 to the second paragraph. That is the paragraph that made me go want to have and read this book to you. Listen closely. And here the Pope is judged and called a liar even by his own theologians for calling us heretics which they do not accept. Just as he was condemned and called a liar by his own lawyers, that he did not have the keys from Matthew 16 because they were solely promised and not given therein. Thus, it is quite certain that no one can judge or punish him. I would not dream of judging or punishing him either, except to say that he was born from the behind of the devil, is full of devils, full of lies, blasphemy and idolatry, is the instigator of these things, God's enemy, antichrist, desolator of Christendom, church robber, key thief, brothel keeper, steward of Sodom, and everything else that was said above. But this is not a verdict judgment or condemnation. Rather, these are sheer eulogies and pledges so that no one is to be praised and honored except the most satanic, the Pope. It would be a good thing if he had to carry them engraved and branded on his crown and forehead. That would fit. His satanty much more honorably, because it is the simple, clear truth, than his letting his feet be kissed. Unquote. The second very powerful paragraph on page 363. And when you know me a little bit, you probably understand why I was interested in having a book where the German Protestant Martin Luther used these expressions to describe the Pope. I'm going to read it again. And here the Pope is judged and called a liar, even by his own theologians, for calling us heretics, which they do not accept. Just as he was condemned and called a liar by his own lawyers, that he did not have the keys from Matthew 16, because they were solely promised and not given therein. Thus, it is quite certain that no one can judge or punish him. I would not dream of judging or punishing him either, except to say that he was born from the behind of the devil. He is full of devils. He is full of lies, blasphemy and idolatry. He is the instigator of these things. He is God's enemy. He is Antichrist desolator of Christendom, church robber, key thief, brothel keeper, steward of Sodom, and everything else that was said above. But this is not a verdict, judgment, or even condemnation. Rather, these are sheer eulogies and pledges, so that no one is to be praised and honored except the most satanic, the Pope. It would be a good thing if he had to carry them engraved and branded on his crown and forehead, that would fit. 
has safety much more honorably because it is the simple clear truth than his letting his feet be kissed. And even though we have not reached a full hour, this is 54 minutes into the reading, I will stop right here because I think this is a good point next time to continue. Again, probably will be repeating this important paragraph on page 363 and from there go on in this point number two that Martin Luther is making in this book and then we go on and see how far we get in the next reading the 18th reading then of against the Roman papacy and institution of the devil for today the 25th of December 2017 I say thank you for watching thank you for listening Thank you for commenting and, uh, well, when you don't receive an answer to my comment, that is probably because your comment is of no importance. And otherwise, comments who are of importance but don't require an answer, I will give a thumbs up and I will only engage in honest biblical comments, not scoffers. I'm done with that. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening, thanks for commenting. Until next time, may God bless you. Jörg from Jogler 66, Hour of the Truth, signing off, says bye-bye. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaks lies shall not escape. And he that speaketh lies shall not escape. A false witness shall not be unpunished. And he that speaketh lies shall not.